I get that your interpretation of devotion um, is based on trust. Um, but I'm also curious about how the act or the orientation towards devotion differs from a bias towards cultishness. Mm. It's a yes, very, in, ter in terms of psychological tendencies yeah. and what have you. This is, I think, a really crucial question. And it's crucial in Tibet. This is not just a problem for us. Uh, if I were to ask myself, <coughs> was there any cultish behavior in Tibet, I think the chances are almost certainly yes, there was. Uh, the girl-disciple relationships or student-teacher relationship were not always impeccable. Uh, I suspect on occasion there was exploitation uh, by the teacher on the student or of the student. I suspect so. I mean, these, after all, we're human beings, and these are human people, tendencies. Yeah. Um, but I think this problem is all the more salient in our modern society, where we already have these flagrant cults around Elvis Presley, and Marilyn Monroe, and the list goes on and on. Sometimes political figures, uh, celebrities, rock stars, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, John Lennon, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and then, of course, some disastrous cults around religious figures. And no need to give examples. We already know what they are. Uh, we are living in a highly individualistic society. We're living in a society that, in some respects, and in some very important respects, is a secular society, not a profoundly spiritual one. Now, it's not to say there's no religion in the West. There certainly is. But we're also, we also have some very, very strong materialistic and, and secular tendencies in the same society. And especially in that context, then when there's a lot of reverence or very deep respect or adulation of an individual, then there is a great possibility of that turning into cultish behavior. And that can happen in a multitude of arenas, and religion is certainly one of them. Now, especially when we get very charismatic figures, uh, that is, they just have an enormous personal attraction. People want to follow them. They want to be with them. They feel great happiness when they're with them. They, list, they hang on every word. Uh, this may catalyze a very profoundly spiritual, transformative relationship that's wonderfully beneficial for the student. And it may also catalyze, alternatively, very cultish, slavish type of behavior, where one diminishes oneself, adulates the object of one's reverence, idolizes that person, and really literally makes that, that individual a cult figure, an idol whom one adulates and follows with slavish obedience. We've seen this with Hitler. We've seen this with Stalin. We've seen this with other political figures, East and West, uh, religious figures, some fundamentalist Christians have that type of charisma, often with disastrous results. And so we are in a society with the individualism, with the materialism, with the secular quality of it, um, where I think this is a, a, should be of grave concern. Uh, and part of this is because our modern, insofar as, we're, our, insofar as our society is secular, and again has these themes of egal egalitarianism coming from our democratic principles, and so we're getting a lot of mis mixed messages here. All men are created equal, on the one hand. All right. And in the Protestant tradition, they don't have saints. And so we're basically all pretty much equally sinners. Do your best, but when all is said and done, the only path to salvation is because Jesus Christ, who is absolutely unlike us in the most important respects, he was born pure, lived pure, died pure, and he's a human being, yeah, but radically unlike us, that salvation is by way of absolute reliance, devotion, to a being who's profoundly unlike us. Human being, yes, but he's a son of God, and we are, in the, in the mainstream Christian view, we are creatures of God, but we're really radically unlike Jesus. And so that's one type of guru devotion, where one emphasizes the disparity, or the discrepancy between oneself and the object of one's devotion. Um, and so there's one model where one is not looking for the common ground so much, but re reinforcing Jesus is primordially pure and I'm pretty primordially screwed up. You know? And therefore, I need somebody radically outside of myself. Um, there's an awful lot to be said about this, so I'll try to be concise and not just run on and on. But we have that current in our society, which is very prevalent. 
uh, and we, we've just learned how prevalent it is from our recent elections. And so there's that whole current. And then we have this whole democratic current, which is very different from this. Egalitarianism, all being created equal. And um, basically, this is democracy. Every vote counts equally. Um, so it's it, a, a, a set of mixed messages in our society. And now Tibetan Buddhism is coming in, sharing neither of those two views. That is, oh sure, all sentient beings have equally the Buddha nature. But the tukus are not created equally with everybody else. The Buddha nature is. But no, these are prodigies. This is, this is the 17th Karmapa. He's not like you at all. He's born. Yeah. He's Chenrezig. He was born Chenrezig. And he's born. And he's Vajrapani. And he's Manjushri. And you were and, salamander or something. Yeah. yeah and yeah, and I'm, I'm a reincarnation of a, of a Hlasa Apso. You know, so in very, very tangible ways, we're not created equal at all. We're profoundly different. These are tukus and these are not tukus. Now, so on the one hand, that looks like, okay, well, that's not egalitarianism, nor is it Jesus Christ kind of thing, because there are a lot of tukus. And then there are, of course, different degrees of being a tuku. I mean, you know, they're not just one category. Um, so, I mean, I think I'll maybe just wrap it up, and you can, you can pursue this further in any, way, any direction you like. But the danger is very real. And I think something that is alien to Buddhism and very dangerous to Buddhism is to introduce the Western notion of icons and cults and idols and introduce this into Buddhism and say, oh, the, the, the Dalai Lama is my idol. And I'm not a Christian, I'm a Buddhist, but now basically he is, to me, what, the, what Jesus is to the Christians, radically unlike me. He's born Chenrezi, and I'm born a schmuck, you know. And he's totally, primordially pure, and I'm really screwed up but I'm going to absolutely rely upon him and do everything he wants, and he's infallible. I'm going to make him a pope. And so everything he says is infallible. Well, if you listen to the Dalai Lama for five minutes, you're going to get no encouragement whatsoever for that type of idolatry. He said, I'm not, I'm not a wonder worker. I'm not infallible. I'm a simple Buddhist monk. And he means everything he says, I believe. And so he's trying to crush this, any kind of impetus for idolatry towards him and, frankly, for any other Tibetan teacher, and I would say probably for anybody in general, because it's not a healthy human attribute. And it's one, of course, it, it's, it has the, the flavor of religious fundamentalism, uh, which can easily turn into cults, into some really nasty business. Where one, and the crucial element of it, and then I'll pause, is the relinquishment of personal responsibility. Uh, I don't need to think for myself anymore. I don't take any, need to take any personal responsibility for my behavior, because I just follow orders. And in terms of my own beliefs, oh, I don't need to take responsibility for that because I just believe what he, whatever he says or whatever this book says or whatever this tradition or this guru lineage says. And I think that is, so don't take those statements out of context. <laughs> I think this is radically incompatible with the whole spirit of Buddhism. Radically incompatible. Where Buddha debated with the people who are following him. The Dalai Lama debates with the monks who are following him, with him. He encourages people to be critical, to be skeptical, to think for themselves and to see how taking personal responsibility, embracing one's own intelligence, and honoring it and using it, is profoundly compatible with deep reverence and devotion to a guru. And that's a, a recipe, the combination of maintaining personal responsibility and intellectual acumen and critical inquiry, and fusing that with profound, profound reverence. I think the best Tibetan practitioners I've known exemplify that. I see both smart, intellectually rigorous minds that are fused with also profound sense of reverence. And that is a fusion that I would like to emulate, and I've tried to. <laughs>